Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the 2021 Research and Innovation Day. Today is our virtual celebration event. I actually shouldn't necessarily say good morning because we have people from the entire world joining us, including later on in our presentation today, we're going to hear from Dr. Abdullah Mabub, our former manager of the Carib Labs about his incredible COVID-19 research. And he's joining us live today in one of our breakout rooms all the way from the United Arab Emirates. Uh, what a remarkable representation of the global reach. My name is Andrew Kozowski, and I have the privilege of being the Center for Research and Innovation, or CRI, as we'll say a lot today. Uh, I am the Industry Outreach and Communications Coordinator. That basically means I'm your welcome door to all things CRI at Fanshawe College. But I won't talk too much about myself right now. Let's get on with the show. First off, I want to say today is all about innovation. And you'll hear that as our constant theme. And I, even in trying something innovative today, I usually have a beard. And I won't tell you why I don't have one today. So there you go. Today, throughout the show, this may be a brand new technology platform that you're not used to. It's a little different than Zoom, which I'm sure you've used a lot. This is going to be really exciting. Throughout to the entire show today, this morning, you'll be able to join breakout rooms and they'll be open for anyone to join. Um, and you, multiple people can join and you can choose to come and go from any breakout room at any time. So feel free now or anytime to request to join any of the rooms at any time until 11.30. You can just click the link below. And just so you know, this is what's so cool about the event or the technology we're using today, is that if you go into any of the breakout rooms at any time, you'll continue seeing the main show that you're watching right now. So you won't miss anything. How cool is that? So this technology that we're going to be using today might be pretty new to you. In fact, it's new to the world, uh, but I hope you really enjoy it because it's pretty awesome. And you're gonna find that out pretty quickly. It's called Mind2. And we found it, uh, but it was right here in London. This is what's happening in London, even beyond the research at Fanshawe. We are so proud that Mind2 sponsored our technology today. This is almost a pilot. They're pretty new uh, and it's already incredible. And they're just gonna keep getting better. This is the future of virtual events developed right here in London, Ontario. And I want to tell you who found them. Fancha is very much, well, we are a college. We're providing education experiences. And that is woven into every part of every operation at Fancha, including all of our operations at CRI. I, myself, am proud to have a world-leading intern from the Corporate Communications and Public Relations Program, Shabnam Demir, who, by the way, has a PhD from Turkey as an international student and newcomer to Canada, uh, who is now excelling in public relations uh, development with an MBA. I am the luckiest internship boss in the world. When we started looking at how to do a really cool live virtual event, uh, we decided to be technology agnostic at first to just find the best way to do this. Shebnam found mine too, and they're right here in London and they're new. Watch them grow. Here's mine too. Welcome to Mind2. We're not just another webinar platform. We built Mind2 to connect yeah, people. Yeah, it's such a pleasure to meet you. Watching is one thing, but watching with people is way better. All you have to do is click the live room tab in the top right hand corner, choose the room that you'd like to go into, and you'll be meeting face to face with other attendees. The best part is, you can talk amongst yourselves. If you have feedback or you'd like to book your own event, visit mindsu.com. And now let's get back to your event. Let's get started with the show. I hope you enjoy the day. I had the privilege of joining CRI about a year and a half ago, slightly after our current chair of research, Dr. Colin Yates, joined 
and created an updated vision of research and innovation that is specifically directed at improving our London regional, provincial and beyond economy through innovation. And we're primarily focused right now on agri-food industry development to grow our economy and in turn, eventually provide more opportunities for businesses to remove their barriers to growth. When the economy grows, there'll be more jobs for Fanshawe students to graduate into and our economy keeps growing and we create new amazing things that improve our world. Colin's here to talk about that now. Hello everyone, I'm Colin Yates. I'm the Chair for Research and Innovation. I would like to welcome everybody to our event and I would like to thank our amazing researchers that, that will be presenting today. They have been a wonderful asset to the Centre for Research and Innovation. I would also like to thank uh, the executive at Fanshawe College for continuing its support of applied research and helping our industry partners grow and be an important part of the economic development of our community. I'd like to give a little bit of context and background about CRI and what we do so you can better understand the depth and the exciting work that we undertake. So really CRI's mission is about helping the economy. We are here to solve industry R&D needs so that they can spend time focusing on what they do best and that's grow their companies. So we apply our expertise, our facilities, our technology, our connections and even funding that we receive through various grant organizations to make sure that these companies continue, continue to scale and grow and be an important part of our community. And we're able to do this through our amazing partner network. Innovation is really a team sport and without these different partners, not just as part of CRI, but as also the greater community, this is what allows our industry partners and applied research and development like we do at Fanshawe College to be successful. So I would like to acknowledge a, a few key ones like the, the Grove at Western Fair, uh, RH Accelerator, Aiming, Bioenterprise, all of which are speaking during our event today. So how does our CRI support advanced R&D? Well, we work with projects that are from the proof of concept product development stage right to product testing and validation. So that companies, no matter what stage they're at, if they're perhaps trying to create a new product, we can help them sort out some of those kinks that they're experiencing to companies that already had products on the market, but now they need to scale that and get more units out there into the market so they can scale their company. Uh, we also help co uh, companies with proposal development and grants. Uh, we connect them to industry partners, as I said before, and as well as research expertise that are not just at Fanshawe College. We have other great partners, as you would have saw, seen, uh, like uh, uh, Western uh, Memorial University. We partner with these different organizations because we recognize that we don't necessarily have all the skill sets and all the research expertise to aid these companies. Our other key focus area is our Carib Food Innovation Lab. This is the industry focus labs where we do a lot of the amazing great work and that you will see a lot of the great work today focused on has actually taken place in that laboratory. So some of the revolutionary food innovation research projects that we focus on and although food is a real primary focus, we, we, you will see uh, projects today that uh, are beyond food and cater to other different industries in the area. But this is really our, our key focus area as we move forward with the growth of CRI and helping the London and regional economy around London continue to grow because food processing is such a, a key economic development area. So one of the key specializations is of course our nutritional and shelf life testing that we do with a lot of food processors around the region especially those early stage companies that we're starting to work with with the Grove at Western Fair, is to make sure that their product is getting out there, uh, doing their quality control so that they're ready to get that product to market. We're also one of the few academic institutions across Canada that have a cannabis research license. 
cannabis is a another interesting area of the agri-food economy around London that we're helping to grow and we're trying to make sure that they have resources so they can and expertise so they can uh, emerge into the food and beverage market and, and you'll see today that we'll have a few examples of some projects that we've worked on like the fritter shop our proof of concept development that we've done with them. You'll see some work from uh, Booch Organic Kombucha as well as Sor Solar Grants Biotechnology. And of course, our funding opportunities. This is what makes uh, R&D possible. Uh, without funding, uh, research and development is a very challenging exercise. And we have to acknowledge our partners like uh, NSERC, the Nat uh, Natural Science and Engineering Research Council of Canada and our partners at FedDev who've created the Tsunami program, which helps support these companies to be successful. And the ability for them to access the amount of funding that we have in our facilities is really what's driving uh, R&D forward and helping these companies achieve uh, what their uh, business aspirations are. So this is really how we help industry leap ahead. We are experts in certain areas, but it's all about unlocking the potential of different sectors and about different partners that we can bring to the table and help R&D commercialization. And I think as you will see with a, a lot of the great work that will be pre being presented today, that there's a great breadth of expertise at Fanshawe College and we continue to grow and develop our expertise as we bring in more facilities and as we continue to help more industry partners around the region. We look forward to uh, the day here and we hope that you enjoy some of the presentations. Thank you. Thank you, Colin. Needless to say, we have an incredible and visionary chair of research here at CRI. And we are extremely fortunate, as you're going to learn throughout the event today, to really be powered by all of the strength across all of Fanshawe College and through all of our partners that are empowering our innovation to take place and to improve our economy and our world. We are improving our world so significantly that as the pandemic unfolded in 2020, we were able to not stop innovation and research. At the time, Dr. Abdullah Mabib was leading our Carib Industry Labs. He has a background in virus research. And that is how we continued to do research all throughout, without a stop, all throughout the pandemic. I'd like to now introduce all the way from United Arab Emirates, where he works now as a professor, Dr. Abdullah Mabib to talk about the groundbreaking COVID-19 research driven right here at Fanshawe by CRI. Hello everyone. My name is Abdullah Mahbub and I'm the former um, lab manager at CARE, the Center of Applied Research in Biotechnology that is part of the Center for Research and Innovation at Fanshawe College. During my time at Fanshawe, we tried to uh, develop some solutions to the COVID-19 pandemic leveraging our um, expertise in biochemistry, the team's expertise in biochemistry and biotechnology. So um, one thing that is usually associated with a poor prognosis in a COVID-19 case is something called the cytokine storm. So once the virus uh, invades the cell, it begins to activate uh, a variety of pro-inflammatory and inflammatory genes. They cause a very massive inflammation response that is associated with a respiratory failure in patients of COVID-19. And there is one particular gene known as IL-6, interleukin-6, that is an excellent marker for this cytokine storm. We have uh, used the, we have a collaboration with Solar Grants Biotechnology. We have used their expertise uh, in producing transgenic tobacco plants, so genetically engineered tobacco plants. These plants have uh, anti-inflammatory cytokines. They are proteins that counteract uh, IL-6. We were then able to also examine 
uh, how different parts of the virus, different proteins of the virus are able to stimulate IL-6 separately. We looked at the S protein. This is the protein that most of you would associate with vaccinations. But we also looked at peptides derived from the interaction region uh, of NSP10 and NSP16. This is a mechanism that the virus uses to escape host immune responses. So um, then we will, uh, and this it seemed that uh, NSP10 as well is able to stimulate this IL-6 response. We were then able to show that we can lower the levels of IL-6 uh, through the use of our tobacco produced um, anti-inflammatory cytokines. So these are um, produced by Solar Grants Biotechnology, our, our partner. And because they are produced in plants, they are very inexpensive to produce on a large scale. So IL-6 stimulation by S-protein, uh, we were the first to demonstrate this in uh, the SARS-CoV-2 virus in the causative agent of COVID-19. Um, to our knowledge, we're the first to look at S-protein purified, that is just S-protein alone landing on a cell and by itself, it's able to stimulate the levels of IL-6. You can see here that compared to the control, S2, which is um, S-protein at two micrograms per milliliter, does not seem to have an, any um, increase. In fact, it's a little bit lower. However, when you up the dose to 20 micrograms per, microliter, per, per milliliter, sorry, the uh, inflammation response is higher. The IL-6 levels are higher. We were able to show that in both human cells and in uh, mice cells. Again, we were the first to be able to demonstrate that in both types of cells. Our tobacco-produced cytokines were able to mitigate this effect, in fact. Most interestingly and very exciting is that we were able to map a specific region of NSP10, the non-structural protein 10. This particular region interacts with NSP16, non-structural protein 16 of the coronavirus, and is used to escape host, um, host defenses. And we were able to map a specific area there that is also able to stimulate um, interleukin-6. This particular area that we mapped is uh, as shown here as peptide 1. So if you look at the top figure, relative IL-6 secretion, essentially peptide 1 is able to increase the IL-6 levels by over four times. However, other peptides, peptide 2 and a TAD peptide, this is a control that we use, do not increase um, the IL-6 level. So um, these sequences that we developed for NSP10, in fact, were meant as inhibitors of the actual virus. So in addition to using um, anti-inflammatory cytokines to mitigate the cytokine storm, we also were trying to develop inhibitors of the actual viral application. However, because of, the ability, because of the peptide's ability to stimulate uh, IL-6 so much, in fact, they have a CC50, which is cytotoxic concentration, that is 50% of the cells die at 11 micromolar concentration of this peptide. Um, this peptide was originally meant to target the methyl transferase. Again, this is the mechanism the virus uses to escape host uh, defenses. The uh, very bad number for toxicity meant that this peptide cannot be used as a drug or even considered to be used as a drug. However, we were able to then modify the design of this peptide by essentially hopping around in the interaction region between NSP10 and NSP16. And we were able to come up with a novel peptide uh, based on computer models. This peptide kills 90% of the virus. We tested the peptide against the actual um, coronavirus. It kills 90% of the virus at a concentration of only 3.8 micromolar. This is considered a good concentration uh, for, uh, to, to be pursued further. It also, more importantly, has no toxicity whatsoever. So in doing so, we believe we found the exact region of NSP10 that is able to stimulate this um, interleukin-6. We also were able to show that in the bottom figure, we were able to show that we can lower that inflammation response using the, um, the anti-inflammatory cytokines produced in tobacco. So not only were we able to map the uh, inflammation response causing region of NSP10, but we were also able to treat it to mitigate the effect essentially. What are we doing right now? Right now we're continuing the collaboration at my current position with Fanshawe College. We're pursuing the use of these cytokines um, 
that are produced in transgenic tobacco as treatments of COVID-19. We're testing actually the cytokines on the ability of the virus to replicate, meaning if uh, does lowering the inflammation response also mean that the virus is replicating less? And there's some hypotheses that would indicate that this is the case. Our peptide inhibitor is currently being modified further and under further consideration as a potential methyl transferase. So this is the mechanism for escaping host defenses, methyl transferase inhibitor. And uh, for the S proteins, we uh, have actually purified and cloned recently a variety of S proteins, from, especially from strains that are known to be uh, evasive, uh, evasion mutants. So these are mutants like the P1, like the, what's called the EEC mutant. These are some mutants that, uh, for which vaccines might be not as effective. And so one of our concerns is to look at whether or not these S protein variants also cause a stimulation of IL-6. Do they cause a higher stimulation of the, um, of the cytokine storm? Is it the same level? And also to look at whether or not our um, anti-inflammatory cytokines are able to mitigate that effect. Finally, I would like to thank the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases, part of the uh, National Institute of Health in the US for allowing us to test our uh, inhibitors against live coronaviruses because that requires a biosafety level three. Solar gas biotechnology is our uh, main partner in this uh, research work. Tsunami for funding. Compute Canada allowed us to use their supercomputing resources to do this design of peptides. The Government of Canada for funding, Anshaw College, of course, and Brock University uh, for uh, collaborating with us on testing uh, the uh, anti-inflammatory cytokines effect on COVID-19 virus. And thank you very much for your time. Not only has Fanshawe's power contributed scientific knowledge to drive strategies for therapy for people who are getting sick with COVID, we're also applying a sustainability first and newcomer first and barrier to employment first strategy to keep people working in a very productive and sustainable way with the power of Fancho's knowledge to tackle all of the practical elements of life during the pandemic. Here to talk about apparel production in the new world of COVID-19 is Professor Jennifer Wright from the School of Design. Hello, my name is Jennifer Wright, and I'm a professor teaching in the fashion design program at Fanshawe College. Along with my teaching, I have incorporated my passion for research and especially research on topics that concern some of the problems that exist in the fashion industry in the hopes that these problems can be mitigated with innovative solutions. The research project I'm going to speak to you about today is called Apparel Production in the New World of COVID-19 reforming and innovating for PPEs, safe manufacturing environments, and remote workers. It was funded by a grant provided by the College and Community Innovation Program Applied Rapid Response to COVID-19. The rapid response requirement is especially significant because it required a very quick pivot from a two-year research project titled PMSW, Poorly Made Shirt Worker, supporting newcomers through textile diversion that my research partner, fashion design faculty, Meredith Jones and I had been working on. This PMSW project was put on hold on March 13th, 2020, when the World Health Organization declared that we had entered a global pandemic. A research outcome of the PMSW project was a physical apparel sewing platform set up at Goodwill Industries in London for skills training, leading to meaningful employment for newcomers to Canada and other persons with barriers to employment. Through the research, we had achieved a fully functioning apparel production platform, leading to employment for graduates of our skills training program. As the primary investigator of the PMSW project, I wanted to use the research outcomes established to figure out how to mitigate the sudden problems presented by the pandemic one being the initial shortage of PPE for frontline workers. 
So together, we decided to collaborate on a new project to research and produce washable and reusable face masks. At the same time, we wanted to set up a COVID-safe physical manufacturing platform, as well as a remote sewing network where employees felt comfortable to work, thus giving them access to a wage while the, econ while the economy shut down. The nonprofit social enterprise Goodwill Industries has been an amazing partner and collaborator with Meredith Jones and I in the research. We have very much supported each other in the pursuit of safe PPE for the general public, skills training, and a safe working environment for community. Goodwill Industries is perfectly positioned for this type of research in that their mission is to provide work opportunities and skills development in order to create a place for everyone to thrive within a sustainable community. CRI, the Center for Research and Innovation, has been fundamental in enabling the research to happen. They brought forward the opportunity to find funding for the project and great, greatly helped in the application process specifically with the writing of the scope, the plan of the research, obtaining letters of support, and the research budget. In addition, as the research proceeds, CRI offers support through budget management, as well as the recruitment and management of student research assistants. CRI is, without a doubt, such a pleasure to work with. The project officially started early May 2020 and has over this 10 month period provided over 210,000 masks to the general public, industry and other nonprofits, thus saving medical PPE for frontline workers. It has also provided co-op learning opportunities for 18 Fanshawe College students when they were trained and hired by Goodwill Industries in the production of the masks. In fact, the research project and Goodwill Industries are the largest sole provider of employment during a co-op period at the college. In addition, two student research assistants worked on the project, giving them some real world experiential learning. Our partner, Goodwill Industries, has benefited from experienced Fanshawe College faculty in the setup of production power sewing and the technology involved in that. This is something that they will apply to other projects in the future. And finally, the project gave the researchers, Meredith Jones and I, an opportunity to put our expertise to work to help mitigate societal challenges brought forward by the COVID-19 pandemic. The power of innovative research at CRI, driven by the knowledge across Fanshawe would not be possible without the support of an incredible amount of partners that have supported and joined CRI, and CRI is supporting all of them with research expertise. This includes support right here in London, Ontario and beyond. We'll start with Jack Adams. Jack Adams is the Manager of Business Growth and Retention for London Economic Development Corporation. And as you're going to learn very quickly from some of our other partners, London Economic Development Corporation and Jack Adams' contributions to drive the economy in London, Ontario, particularly in agri-food, is very strategic and is directly connected through CRS support to an entire network that's happening in the London region to really make our region a very quickly growing leader in Canada of agri-food research. Watch us grow. Here's Jack. So th thanks to the, uh, the folks at the CRI, the Center for Research and Innovation at Fanshawe College. It's been a great pleasure to work with them to uh, connect local industry to research and development opportunities, um, opportunities to innovate, opportunities to access all the skilled labor and all the talented folks at the CRI. It brings a lot of benefit to the local industrial community and the LEDC is very grateful for this partnership. So thanks, thanks a lot to everybody there. Uh, thanks so much for being such a great partner for us at LEDC and uh, really looking forward to the collaboration moving forward. I think uh, local industry is uh, really the benefactor of all of your hard work. Uh, thanks guys. Another very important partner that came on board in 2020 through a partnership with CRI is BioEnterprise Canada. 
Here to speak about Bioenterprise Canada and why CRI plays a role in driving innovative growth for Canada's agri-food industry is Aaron Meisner, Strategic Communications Manager for Bioenterprise. And I have a surprise. Aaron is going to talk about something incredibly new. CRI is going to help with a competition being led by the Canadian Space Agency that's going to get us food to get us into space. Let's hear from Aaron. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining me today to celebrate Research and Innovation Day in 2021. My name is Aaron Meisner, and I am the Strategic Communications Manager for BioEnterprise, Canada's food and agritech engine. We are a network and a hub for acceleration services and business support funding programs in the agricultural and related sectors. Innovation is becoming the word that I use most in my day to day, from describing the food and agritech ecosystem where BioEnterprise operates to the technologies coming to market from the producers, processors, farmers, and researchers in those sectors. What that means to me and my team is that we are finding new ways of looking at challenges that we continue to face with a focus on where we can be in the future. Food security and food waste, sustainability and climate change, these are global concerns that we cannot address treating them like individual issues instead of social issues. That is why it is so critical for us to have thought leaders like Fanshawe's Center for Research and Innovation applying practical services to ambitious solutions rising up from the innovation landscape. BioEnterprise has started Canada's Food and Agritech Engine, a membership of like-minded startups and SMEs and critical services to help them scale and grow their business. We are unifying the agricultural ecosystem behind an innovation-focused model to generate economic impact and increase collaboration. Fanshawe plays a critical role in helping to translate some early stage technologies into viable market products and provides expertise and guidance on specific areas, such as beverage production and manufacturing. When so much knowledge exists across Ontario and Canada as a nation, it is critical to work together to leverage the best minds available. And we feel strongly that we have taken a great step in that direction with our Fanshawe partnership. Recently, the Canadian Space Agency has opened up a Canada-wide challenge to address food scarcity and security on Earth. The long-term goal of the challenge is to create compact, low-impact technologies for producing end-product food items that can then support long-duration space missions where bringing a full food supply as cargo is not logistically feasible. This deep space food challenge is a conceptual step towards encouraging innovation in food production and seeing what food and agricultural sectors can offer to address ongoing food security concerns and future possibilities. BioEnterprise and our partner Zone AgTech in Quebec have partnered with the CSA to connect industry and innovators to the challenge and ensure that we are seeing the strongest teams we can produce nationally. To help reach that goal, we are hosting a networking event that will focus on facilitating networking among interested Canadian innovators and teams to build more collaborative and encompassing solutions. That event will take place on April 29th, and you can find information about the challenge on Impact Canada's website or reach out to the BioEnterprise team to get connected. Ultimately, our goal is to drive innovative excellence in Canada's food and agritech industries, and we are proud to have Fanshawe as a leading knowledge and development partner. I am happy to be here to support them today and to encourage all of our viewers to get involved, take that next step, and let the Center for Research and Innovation put you on the path towards growth and success. Thank you. As Colin Yates said in his presentation, CRI's work to support businesses in their growth through innovative research requires a lot of support. We are very grateful for the support from FedDev through NSERC and Tsunami, but there's more. CRI is now a partner with Aiming. Aiming provides a wealth of resources to businesses looking for support with funding. Here to talk about what Aiming does is Diane Warden, Aiming's business development manager. Good morning, everybody. First and foremost, I want to say thank you to the team at Fanshawe and CRI for the invitation to attend today's celebration event and to speak to you for a few minutes about our partnership with the Center for Research Innovation at Fanshawe. My name is Diane Warden. I am the regional manager at Amy Canada. We are a global advisory firm providing funding services for small, medium businesses and also support many global enterprises. Our clients and partners know us best 
as uh, a core aspect of Aiming's existence in Canada is to help companies fund innovation and their growth. I will start with a brief overview of Aiming. We are a global firm that operates in 15 countries worldwide and have been in business for over 30 years. Our focus is helping businesses fund their, their innovation and future grow, growth needs through a comprehensive government funding strategy focused on leveraging shred, federal and provincial grants and interest-free loans. We secure $1.5 billion a year annually for our clients and deliver this important service risk-free since we only get remunerated on successful applications and secured funding. Unlike other service providers in Canada, we also have a teller service for early stage companies, helping them with their important needs. We perform this important work with each client on an ongoing basis and start by reviewing all their past and future expenditures. We then identify all government grants and funding and savings that they qualify. In addition to doing the assessing and all the funding, we complete robust applications, refunds, and position your company for success and manage all of the reporting requirements that come after. There is significant funding available to SMEs in Canada that will contribute to capital purchases, hiring, training, export activities, R&D, and more. Just to remind you, this service is provided by Aiming on a success fee basis, meaning no upfront fee costs, no retainers, and no risk. Companies who are in the technology, agri-food or manufacturing sectors are great candidates for these funding opportunities. Once again, we are very excited about our partnership with CRI and are available at any time to discuss opportunities with you. Thank you and have a great day. Not every company or business or entrepreneur who's ready to do something big has the space, knowledge or connections to make it happen right now. CRI can help with the innovative research. We also help very strongly with the connections to get going. And that is what our partners do. CRI is now one of the lead research partners of The Growth, which is a very, very important and brand new initiative located at the Western Fair District here in London, Ontario. The Grove is an incubator and co-working and co-facility space for agri-food businesses ready to do something big. Here to talk about The Grove is the CEO of Western Fair District, Reg Ash. Hello from The Grove at Western Fair District. Thank you for inviting us to be part of Research and Innovation Day 2021. My name is Reg Ash and I am the President and CEO of Western Fair Association. I will talk briefly about the Grove at Western Fair District, how it is positioned to support regional agri-food innovation, and how the Centre for Research and Innovation will strengthen that future by supporting the Grove's partner companies. Western Fair District is the operating name and physical location of the Western Fair Association, an agricultural society incorporated under the Agricultural and Horticultural Societies Act of Ontario. Western Fair Association has been operating in London, Ontario, since it held its first agricultural exhibition the Western Fair in 1868, and it was incorporated as an act of parliament in 1887. Several years ago, the association made a commitment, first to itself through the creation of an agricultural purpose statement, then to the community through a facilitated process to update its core mandate, which led to the idea of the Grove at Western Fair District. Being one of two deemed agricultural societies, the association for many years fulfilled its requirements under the act by hosting an annual exhibition and conducting horse racing. However, we recognized we needed to do more. This renewed commitment that Western Fair Association will be the leader of Canadian agricultural societies, supporting the agriculture community with programming and facilities that help meet the business needs of this sector, while at the same time providing innovative educational experiences for today's consumer was the beginning of our journey to find relevancy in the 21st century. We engaged a consultant specialized in agriculture policy to assist in the process. After conducting several focus groups, we prepared a white paper that would lead to the creation of the Grove. The Grove would allow the association to lead, educate, and connect with communities it serves. Through repurposing some of the association's facilities, the Grove will support agriculture innovation 
within Southern Ontario. The Grove is a collection of physical spaces and digital assets that together with its collaborators will provide wraparound supports for developing companies in the agri-food and agri-tech industries in Southern Ontario. The primary location of the Grove is 100,000 square feet of former exhibition buildings that will be renovated to create individual production spaces for growth mode companies, has a teaching kitchen and meeting space that will allow Growing Chefs Ontario to increase the impact of its food literacy programs, and will house an agri-food incubator to assist up-and-coming food and beverage entrepreneurs develop and improve their product. In January 2021, the Grove and its collaborators, the London Economic Development Corporation, the Roundhouse Accelerator, the London Small Business Centre, the London Training Centre, Western University, and Fanshawe College announced a $7.2 million FedDev Ontario grant that would leverage an additional $10 million to stimulate agri-food investments in Southern Ontario. As the inductees of the Middlesex County Agriculture Hall of Fame demonstrate, Middlesex County has a long history of innovation in agriculture. The county and neighboring regions produce significant agricultural inputs that have created a strategic advantage for the regional economy leading to millions of dollars being invested in agri-food production facilities. This, of course, is nothing new. There is an abundance of agri-food products used in our daily lives that are directly connected with London Middlesex. While established companies have the wherewithal to conduct their own research and innovation, newer companies need to lean on others that specialize in this area, which is why the Grove and the Centre for Research and Innovation have chosen to collaborate. The suite of services that CRI brings to the table will allow the Grove's partner companies to reach their potential through creating innovative products. CRI will help companies in the Grove with product testing and validation, nutritional analysis, and product shelf life testing. Together, the Grove and CRI will unlock innovation in the region's agri-food industry. Thank you. The next partner that I am pleased to introduce is RH Accelerator. I hope you're starting to see that there's a lot of connection with the partners that we're talking about right now. And RH Accelerator plays an important role in all of this. I mean, London Economic Development Corporation, our neighboring economic development corporations in our region and beyond throughout Canada are a really important piece of getting our agri-food economy growing. And now we've built the Grove at Western Fair that we're helping with. But when companies are ready to get bigger, sometimes they need investment. Uh, someone who's ready to put their faith in them that they're doing something incredible or going to do something even more incredible. CRI will get them there with research. Our H Accelerator will get them there with funding. Let's hear from Michael Dales, our H Accelerator's marketing coordinator and project manager. Hello, Research and Innovation Day. At RH Accelerator, we're really excited to be here today. My name is Michael Dales, and I'm here on behalf of our founders, Brian, David, and Joe. We're excited to work with the Center for Research and Innovation at Fanshawe College. Many of our founders and their teams have attended Fanshawe, and we've been impressed with the vision and growing capabilities of the Center for Research and Innovation. The RH Accelerator was created on the belief that founders should step up and help other founders to create a great entrepreneurial ecosystem. This is why at RH Accelerator, we invest in early stage companies, helping the founders and their teams to grow their business. At RH Accelerator, we provide significant resources and support carried out by a very experienced team of startup founders with extensive network of mentors, investors, and business professionals. We invest in the next generation of companies and only profit when our companies succeed. We're working with many great local technology companies like Visitor Q, Curling Zone, User, Sisterhood Media, Cannabis Wiki, and MindSue, to name a few. If you're interested in learning more about these companies or other companies we're working with, visit our website. At RH Accelerator, we're working with the Center for Research and Innovation to help grow innovative scale up businesses in the agriculture and food industry. The partnership will encourage RH Accelerator companies to access the considerable resources offered through the CRI, as well as provide CRI access to the network and resources in the RHA ecosystem. This is a valuable new relationship that connects innovative companies to the research, development, and the resources they require to bring new products to market. At RH Accelerator, we exist for one purpose, helping business owners, founders, and their teams in early stage companies achieve their dreams. We believe that working with other organizations like the Center for Research and Innovation is the only way to make that happen. 
If you are a founder or know a founder who needs help, you can reach out to me at michael.dales at rhaccelerator.com or through our website at www.rhaccelerator.com. Thank you. Now's the time for the part of today that I know you're really looking forward to. It's time to celebrate the top research student work of the entire year at Fanshawe College. Fanshawe College just keeps impressing everyone. We're really doing it here. This has been literally the most challenging year we could have ever had at Fanshawe. The fact that we have more student projects that we're showing today than last year, and those projects were submitted to me last year before the pandemic started, and we have more this year. These were all done during the pandemic. Way to go, Fanshawe. Uh, students, faculty supported them, all the staff work. Like, this is amazing. Uh, so congratulations to everybody. Right now, I'm, I, I'm proud to unveil the 2020-21 Fanshawe Research Project Virtual Gallery. It's live right now and it'll be live all year. I know you're gonna be blown away. Of all of the many projects that were submitted of incredible research at Fanshawe, our chair of research, Dr. Colin Gates, has selected three best of the best research projects. And we're gonna hear an elevator pitch from each of them. First off is a project called School Delivery Choices During COVID-19. That's very important. Fancha is really doing the very best, probably in my opinion, the entire world in delivering amazing education in a really tough time. This is a project conducted by the Faculty of Health, Community Studies and Public Safety, specifically the School of Community Studies. The researchers are Ashley Shirley, Stephanie Garrels, and Jane Enriquez. Their supervisor is Dr. Sandra Lackenbauer. Here they are. Hello, my name is Jane Henriques and my colleagues Ashley Shirley and Stephanie Garrels are fourth year students in the Honors Bachelor of Early Childhood Leadership degree program. We are so honored to have been selected as one of the top three best of the best of this year's Fanshawe College's Research and Innovation Day. We are here to share important and rich findings we discovered during our capstone research study on how parents utilize the voice of the child when making a return to school decision during the COVID-19 pandemic. COVID-19 has been a catalyst for change and a time to re-examine many aspects within theory, policy, and practice of the early childhood education and care sector. This pandemic allowed for review how parents approach decision-making and if they encourage the participation of their children when making a decision to return to the classroom for face-to-face -face instruction or online learning in September 2020. For the purpose of this study, the voice of the child refers to a child's ability to exert agency, autonomy, and impact their own circumstances. Hello, I'm Stephanie. We identified three common themes within the literature. The theory of utilizing children's voices in education, healthcare, legal matters, and everyday life is encouraged and supported through documents like the United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child and theorists such as Erickson. Yet the practice of adults and children's lives endorsing the voice of the child is flawed. The literature showed that representation and understanding of children's voice is largely done through the adults in their lives. Children express their voice through their behavior, silence, and play. This leaves room for interpretation. The adult's understanding of voice determines the extent of authenticity in the representation of the child's voice. The third theme centered around parents and how their own agency, autonomy, and control of their lives impact their ability and desire to support their child's voice. The gap identified within the literature was that parental perspectives on the voice of the child was unknown, which is 
critical because parents dictate so much of a child's context, it is impossible to ignore their impact on the ways in which a child can exercise their voice. Hi, I'm Ashley Shirley. A non-probability sampling method was used to recruit parents who had children aged 5 to 11 and who were faced with making a back-to-school decision for the fall of September 2020. 105 participants from various online parent organizations participated in the COVID-19 return to school survey and 93 responses were used in data analysis as some did not meet the requirements. Table one shows the general characteristics of the sample population. Participants were mainly married or in domestic partnerships, women 35 years or older working full or part-time and earning 100,000 or greater with children in the age range of eight to 11. We sought to determine trends across parents regarding behaviors, barriers face and attitudes towards the back to school decision for their children. A quantitative survey design guided the construction of a questionnaire to measure these variables. The study used IBM SPSS statistical software for data analysis that included reliability analysis and one sample t-test in Cronbach Alpha, which used reliability statistics to measure if children's participation in the back to school decision for September 2020 was strongly endorsed, moderately endorsed, or not included. Table two shows the descriptive and inferential statistics for the variables used in the COVID-19 return to school survey to measure parents' perspectives, behaviors, and attitudes toward including children in the back to school decision. Parents indicated that they were including moderate levels of the voice of the child through observation and interpretation of the child in the back to school decision-making process. Whereas behaviors that indicated parents were strongly including the voice of the child in the decision, such as child-directed discussion, still showed a positive trend, but not to the extent of the moderate levels. When measuring the behavior of withholding information from children in this decision, the results showed that this was not practiced. Parents reported that family circumstances influenced their decision-making process. This indicated that the decision was complex and included many factors. Regarding barriers, a majority of parents reported their child's mental health as the primary factor. Although many parents reported attending to their child's preferences, ultimately other factors outweighed the importance of the child's shared decision making. It is important to mention that there was a higher than anticipated population of participants whose children attended privately funded educational communities and those who indicated having household incomes of greater than 100,000. We acknowledge that this is not an accurate representation of London, Ontario's general population. Overall, the results showed that children were involved in the decision-making process to a degree, but their involvement was not a significant factor in the final decision which corresponds with previous findings. The results were consistent with the literature about theory of participation, which indicated moderate levels of endorsement of the voice of the child on a consultative level, whereas parental behaviors that promote child agency and autonomy were endorsed, but not as strongly. Additionally, concerns regarding children's mental health was indicated as the primary factor in the final decision. This aligns with previous research that found parents' desire to protect their children affected how much autonomy their child would be granted. These findings suggest that while parents are aware of and willing to consider the voice of the child, their concerns regarding protection superseded their child's autonomy, at least in this context. This study aimed to determine if and how parents included their children in decision making, the results showed parents did include the voices of their children in moderate ways. The results also indicated that barriers created hurdles for the inclusion of the voice of the child. On behalf of our research team, it has been an honor and a privilege to participate in the Research and Innovation Day. Thank you. I should mention these three Vasa Lettuce projects are in no particular order. They're all the best. Our next project is called Ergonomic Task Analysis of a Lawn Fertilization Task. This is from the Faculty of Health, Community Studies, and Public Safety, specifically the School of Public Safety. The researcher on this project is Caleb Leary. Let's hear from Caleb. 
Hello, my name is Caleb Leary. I'm a student of the Advanced Ergonomic Studies program here at Fanshawe, and my project was an ergonomic task analysis of a lawn fertilization task. And I'm honored to be selected as one of the best of the best projects, uh, given that there were so many deserving candidates. So thank you very much to those uh, that determined that my project was worthy. Um, so for those of you who aren't familiar with ergonomics, uh, ergonomics is concerned with how individuals interact with their working environment and what processes or elements within this environment uh, may put that worker at risk for developing an injury, uh, which we call ergonomic risk factors, such as poor posture, repetitive movements, or high forces, uh, among others. So my research project as part of the AES course curriculum involved uh, working with the lawn care company Weedman uh, to analyze a worker performing the task of lawn fertilization uh, and assessing whether or not any components of this job put the worker at risk for developing an injury. So this job involved lawn care technicians, which are just referred to as techs, uh, loading their equipment, which included bags of fertilizer and their fertilizer spreader. Uh, into the work truck in the morning and stopping at all the properties on their side routes uh, to fertilize clients' lawns, which, which would reach up to an average of about 25 lawns uh, per eight hour shift. Uh, and this is, just, uh, this is just a diagram of the route that techs would take when they loaded their trucks in the morning uh, and the process of fertilizing a lawn, which is essentially just going back and forth over the lawn with the spreader to cover the entire surface area. So each time they got to a property, uh, they had to manually lift the spreader out of the pickup truck and then back into the truck when they were finished. Uh, and the spreader weighed about 42 pounds without any fertilizer in it. So uh, this task demonstrated some ergonomic risk factors. Uh, first of all, the horizontal distance between the worker and the spreader that he was lifting. Uh, was quite large, especially when extending the spreader into the truck. And a larger horizontal distance between the person and the load they are carrying, uh, this will put more compression on the intervertebral discs of the person's spine, especially when the load is heavier, which in this case it was 42 pounds, which is quite heavy. Um, secondly, the worker would twist their spine up to 60 degrees when extending the spreader into the truck and twisting of the spine while lifting also uh, increases the vulnerability of the inter intervertebral disc to injury. Uh, and finally, the positioning of the worker's arms in a flex position up to almost 90 degrees while holding the 42 pound load was also a risk factor for the shoulders. So the assessment of the task was performed using University of Michigan 3D SSPP which is a digital human modeling software. And the postures of the worker were inputted into the software as well as the external loading. Uh, and it was determined that the low back compression associated with the spreader lift, um, it, it exceeded the permissible limit of 3,400 Newtons. Um, and additionally, the required strength capabilities for the shoulders uh, were only acceptable for approximately 54% of the male population. So an additional analysis was done, which took into account all of the other aspects of the fertilizing job, such as loading the truck and actually pushing the spreader, uh, as well as the spreader lifts, uh, which revealed a cumulative total of an over 80% probability of developing a low back disorder uh, just from performing this job. So among a couple other recommendations, it was recommended to management that uh, tailgate ramps be installed on each of the trucks, which would eliminate the need to manually lift and lower the spreaders from the truck. So installing these ramps on the entire fleet of trucks at the company would cost around $6,500. However, the estimated cost that a company suffers due to back and shoulder injuries is almost $18,000. Uh, therefore, this investment would eliminate the hazards associated with lifting the spreader to and from the truck and could potentially return up to 57% on their investment, as well as reducing the overall probability of a low back disorder from above 80% uh, down to around 33%.
And thank you very much for listening. Our next project in the best of the best is called Hazard Awareness and Training in Ontario Farm Operations. This is a particularly neat project to talk about. It's about Ontario farm operations. And you're going to hear next after this about the industry project work that CRI is leading to grow through R&D, our agri-food economy. So our faculty, staff and students are also working on agri-food. That's how it's all connected at Fanshawe. That's the power of Fanshawe. Right now, we're working really hard on growing our agri-food economy because that makes sense for our region. We're not done. There's a lot more to come. But let's hear about this project on Ontario Farm Operations, which is an entire faculty-wide project from the Faculty of Business, Information Technology, and Part-Time Studies, specifically from the London South Campus, which is a pretty new facility in the Fancho Network. The researchers on this project are Aya and Navneet, supervised by Sandra Wilson from the Agribusiness Management Program. They were supported by another partner of CRI, and that's the Ontario Federation of Ar that is the Ontario Federation of Agriculture. Here's their project. Hello, my name is Sandra Wilson, and I coordinate the Agribusiness Management Program at London South Campus. I was also the faculty lead for this research project, Hazard Awareness and Training at Ontario Farm Operations. Hello, I'm Aya Balbachi. And I'm Navneet Kaur Dhaliwal. Aya and I both graduated from the Agribusiness Management Program in 2020, during which time we had the chance to work as research assistants for this project. You may not know, but agriculture is a dangerous business. And in Ontario, the agriculture industry often has the highest injury rate. The Ontario Federation of Agriculture wants to do something about this. They are the largest general farm organization in Ontario and represent 38,000 farm family members across the province. Now about the research, we attended the London Farm Show in 2020 and surveyed farm owners and farm workers, asking them about the hazards at their farm operation. The training that workers receive and the challenges farm owners experience when training the workers. We then compared the survey results to legislation relevant to the farming operations. What did we find out? The most common hazards identified by farm owners and workers included farm equipment, heavy lifting, and noise. This changed depending on type of the operation. When it comes to providing training, two challenges faced by farm owners included deciding what training should be provided and what made a training good. In some cases, the legislation outlines what should be included in the training, but this is not the case for all hazards. What we did learn is that not all workers are receiving the training information that's required by the Ontario Hazard Awareness and Training Regulation. In fact, only 60% of farm owners were providing training to their paid workers. That's not surprising though, since farm owners reported that they were not always aware of the legislation that applied to them. Finally, where the law requires training records to be retained, only 42% of farm owners are actually maintaining those records. We have shared our findings with the Ontario Federation of Agriculture. Their plan is to develop uh, free research resources for both farm owners and farm workers to address those issues, which we hope will help improve safety on the farm and reduce worker injuries. Finally, thank you for your interest in our research project. Amongst the multitude of supports that have made today and that make the incredible world-changing research that takes place at CRI and across all of Fanshawe possible. 
one group at Fancha is at the heart of supporting students. And like always, they've stepped it up when students needed it most. And my goodness, have students needed it this year. That is none other than, of course, the number one supportive students at Fancho College, our Fancho Student Union. Because the Fancho Student Union is so incredibly supportive of students, every single student that has been a part of the 33 projects showcased during our 2021 Research and Innovation Day celebration, every single student is receiving a $150 credit to their Fancho account to spend in whatever way is most useful to the student on behalf of the Fanshawe Student Union. That is how Fanshawe is there for students. Thank you, Fanshawe Student Union. The next section of today's program might be new and surprising, but hopefully very inspiring about what CRI is up to. Right now, our mission is to help the agri-food sector to grow our regional economy with the expertise and facilities of CRI. The whole theme is removing barriers for industry growth. That's what we do. Let's hear from our first project. The Fritter Shop was supported by CRI. If you've ever been to the Western Fair Market or now some of their franchises that CRI has helped them be able to create a franchise model. Well, I cannot, uh, this is scientific fact. They are the best baked good in the entire world. Let's hear from their founder and CEO, Kelvin Van Ryn. Hi everyone, I'm Cal Van Ryan. I'm the founder and CEO of The Fritter Shop, and I decided to work with the CRI in January of last year. The project ran from January to March of 2020. A little bit about The Fritter Shop, uh, we're a family business that started back in Amsterdam back in 1989. My parents ran the business there for about 12 years before assigned to move to Canada. Um, fritters are traditionally eaten on uh, New Year's Eve to celebrate the coming of a new year in the, Nether in the Netherlands. Um, what we did is we took that concept and we just added a bunch of different flavors. So now we have apple fritters, which is of course the classic, and we also have blueberry, cherry, and then ranging all the way to cherry cheesecake and brownie fritters. So why we worked with the CRI is our production was just not keeping up with the demand. So we were currently making about 3,000 fritters a week, and we really need to scale that to about 6,000 fritters a week. Um, we also had thoughts of franchising the business, and we knew that we had to scale up. We just didn't know exactly what parts we wanted to do that with. So identifying our needs, a CRI researcher came into the bakery to examine our current processes. He identified that the biggest bottleneck was our frying process. So our current process allowed us to make about 44 fritters every nine minutes. Um, and this needed two employees to do that. Uh, this cost us about $30 an hour and produced about 264 fritters in that hour. Um, we looked into alternative frying processes. There was a couple automated ones that we were looking at. We actually found that an innovative submerging solution was the best fit for us. Um, it automated the frying process while also maintaining all the product properties. Um, it also cooked the fritters in seven minutes rather than uh, nine or 10 because it fully submerged the fritters, meaning that they cook faster. So therefore reducing frying time and increasing efficiency. The CRI researcher began immediately looking uh, for possible fryers that would fit what we're looking for. Um, and we found a solution that actually made our process up to six times as efficient. So now instead of frying um, the 264 fritters an hour, we were looking at 1800 fritters that we could fry in an hour with the same two employees at the same $30 an hour labor cost. Uh, where we are now, so COVID did throw a wrench in our plans, uh, but we have rebounded since. Uh, we've opened up two new franchise locations and we have plans to open an additional six for the remaining of 2021. Uh, we're opening up a production facility and that'll open up in May. That's actually inside the Grove at the Western Fair. 
And uh, not just that part of the growth, but my personal growth, as far as the process efficiency, I've looked at, I've learned to look at it through a different lens now. So um, whenever I'm in the baker and I'm like, oh, we could probably do that quicker if we did it this way. And, and that was another thing that I definitely learned from the uh, working with the CRM. So the finances of the project, uh, the project cost a total of $12,345. Uh, the Fritter Shop's cash contributions was about $1,200. Uh, the Fritter Shop's in-kind contribution was $6,000. Uh, the Tsunami contribution was about $4,945. And Fanshawe's in-kind uh, contribution was $200. And that was my experience with the CRI. Another incredibly successful project that we're doing another project on because the first one was such a success is developing more successful research to keep the growth going for London-based Booch Organic Kombucha. Let's hear from owner and master fermenter, Shannon Cannons. Hi everybody, I am Shannon Caymans. I'm the CEO of Booch Inc. And we are the manufacturers of healing organic beverages here in London, Ontario. Uh, and we have two product lines. Um, so the first is Booch Organic Kombucha. It's a probiotic fermented tea that's made with uh, black tea and cane sugar. And our second product line is Moon Brew by Booch. It is a probiotic honey tonic called June. And that one is made with green tea and honey. Um, so both June and kombucha have been around for over 2,000 years, uh, one originating in China and June originating in Nepal. Uh, so at Booch, we believe in the body's innate ability to heal itself and that by incorporating a diverse range of uh, fermented foods in your diet, uh, that you're populating your gut with these beneficial microbes that really help to enhance the immune system um, and make you stronger and healthier. Um, so our drinks are really delicious um, and quite refreshing, and we're distributed throughout about 650 locations across Ontario and now in BC as well. Um, so even though the art of kombucha fermentation is a 2000 year old tradition, uh, the science behind kombucha fermentation is still quite new. And um, so one of the challenges we faced as a new brand was fully understanding the, um, this, this living beverage at a scientific level. Um, it is a new industry here. And so we discovered the need to understand the process of monitoring specific aspects of the kombucha fermentation process. Um, one of the most important being measuring alcohol. So the challenge created an opportunity for us to work with Fanshawe and the Center of Research and Innovation to really discover the appropriate method in detecting trace amounts of ethanol in our kombucha. Um, so as you may know, ethanol is a byproduct of the fermentation process. So when yeast is consuming sugar, it releases carbon dioxide and ethanol. And in our process um, in fermentation, we have an oxygenated process. So that allows for the bacteria to also thrive in that environment and bacteria will consume some of the ethanol. So you can see that we really needed to find a method that detects just the trace levels of ethanol produced. Um, so we did start working with Fanshawe um, to figure out how we could ensure that we were meeting the industry standards as a company um, and the government regulations. So in general, you're not allowed to serve any type of beverage or sell a beverage that's over 0.5% ethanol. So we worked with Fanshawe and the Center for Research and Innovation to determine an accurate and effective process to measure this trace amount of alcohol. And what we did was we successfully found a cost-effective approach uh, that we still use at our facility today. Um, so this was a huge accomplishment for Booch. Um, it allows us to be innovators in the industry and remain competitive and really understand our processes. Um, additionally, we're currently working on a new project with Fanshawe. Uh, our principal investigator is Kamal al Rafia, and we're working to determine a way to emulsify uh, CBD into our kombucha. And so we're really excited for 
this new project and to see where it will take us um, as innovators in the industry. Um, so we've been really grateful to partner with Fanshawe and have the support um, since our beginning of a company over six years ago. And uh, I'd be happy to answer any other questions you may have. Our next successful agri-food industry project is supporting a company called Solar Grants Biotechnology Incorporated. This is some pretty amazing science that they're doing. Let's hear from the principal investigator, Fanshawe Professor Peter Anborg from the School of Applied Science and Technology, supported by an incredible student research assistant, Misha Owens. My name is Peter Anborg and I'm a professor here at Fanshawe College and my expertise is in biomedical research spanning several decades. In our project, we investigated the bioactivity of a plant produced human cytokine. Beside me is Nisha Owens, who is a very talented third year student in the biotechnology program. Also pictured is Dr. Igor Kolotelin, who is the chief scientific officer and president of our industry partner, Solar Grants Biotechnology. Igor is an expert in plant biotechnology who has previously held positions as an NSERC visiting fellow at Agriculture Canada and as a visiting scientist in the Department of Biology at Western University. Solar Grants Biotechnology is a young Canadian biotech company focused on harnessing the power of photosynthesis into the production of recombinant proteins. The company develops state-of-the-art engineered tobacco plant lines that express and accumulate various recombinant proteins and peptides. To this end, a so-called gene gun is used to deliver DNA constructs to the tobacco plant cells. The Carib Lab has recently acquired this piece of equipment pictured on the left, and we and our partners are very excited about it. Usually, a startup company such as SGB doesn't have its own lab or funds to buy this type of expensive equipment. The way it works is that you coat cold particles with DNA and then literally shoot the particles onto the plant cells or even onto the plant leaves. The plant cells then take up the particles and start producing the protein that is encoded by the DNA. Here we see extract from tobacco leaves where all proteins have been separated according to size and stained with a blue dye. To the left, you see a protein extract from regular tobacco leaves. And to the right, you see a protein extract from leaves from tobacco plants that express a large amount of recombinant protein. This recombinant protein is then purified from the extract and characterized. And so now uh, I'll give it over to Nisha. Hi, I'm Nisha Owens. I'm a third year student in the biotechnology program at Fanshawe, and I did my co-op last summer with the Center for Research and Innovation at Fanshawe College. In our project, the recombinant protein was a human anti-inflammatory cytokine. We first verified the plant-produced cytokine by Western blotting. In this technique, the protein is immobilized on a membrane and incubated with a commercially available antibody that specifically recognizes this and no other protein. As can be seen from the picture, there was a strong reaction with anti-cytokine antibody, proving the correct protein was produced and purified. Next, I verified the correct folding of the protein using a technique called enzyme-linked immunosorbent assay, or ELISA for short. In this assay, a first antibody that is specific for the protein of interest is bound to a plastic plate. Then the protein of interest is added, followed by a secondary antibody, that is different from the first, but also specific for the protein of interest, creating a sandwich. The second antibody is linked to an enzyme that creates a yellow color, but only when the sandwich is formed. The sandwich is only formed when the protein of interest is properly folded. Proper folding is in turn crucial for the protein to be active. Since the ELISA results indicated that the protein was properly folded, I next tested the activity of the plant-produced human cytokine in the following assay. I first grew human lung cancer cells in a dish, then treated the cells with a peptide derived from a SARS-CoV-2 protein. Next, I measured the production of the pro-inflammatory cytokine IL-6 by the lung cells using an ELISA. My results indicated that treatment with the SARS-CoV-2 peptide greatly stimulated the production of IL-6. This is reminiscent of the so-called cytokine storm, a strong burst of pro-inflammatory cytokines 
seen in patients with severe cases of COVID-19. I then repeated the experiment, but prior to treating the cells with the SARS-CoV-2 peptide, I first incubated the cells with our plant-produced recombinant anti-inflammatory cytokine. My results showed that pretreatment with the plant-produced anti-inflammatory cytokine prevented the increase in IL-6 production by the lung cells in the presence of the SARS-CoV-2 peptide. In conclusion, the plant-produced anti-inflammatory cytokine was correctly folded as shown by its recognition in specific western blot and ELISA assays. The recombinant cytokine prevented the expression of IL-6 in the presence of SARS-CoV-2 peptide. Therefore, this plant-produced anti-inflammatory cytokine may help prevent the cytokine storm in certain COVID-19 patients. Students are very clearly doing incredible things at Financial College. Empowered to succeed by incredible staff and faculty. You've already heard from Nisha about her student contributions to research at CRI. We're going to now hear from another student research assistant, Alejandro Mota Lozano. By the way, there's going to be a lot more research opportunities for students as CRI keeps going. And research is a really unique thing that students have access to at Fanshawe College. It's a signature learning experience at Fanshawe to have research experience. Not a lot of colleges are doing this. Let's hear from Alejandro about his work supporting specifically the Food Safety Alliance, but more generally about how students support the research experience at CRI. Hello. My name is Alejandro Mota, and I am part of the research team belonging to the CRI at Venture College. I have expertise in areas such as chemistry and microbiology. I am currently in my third year for the Chemical Laboratory Technology Program, and I have been working at Venture for about a year now. I am going to be answering some questions about the project I have been working on. So who is the partner you support it? I am supporting FSA, also known as Food Safety Alliance. What barrier did the partner face that they needed R&D support from CRI to solve? What strains of bacteria cannot be tested in regular workplaces? A Biosafety Level 2 certification is needed, and only certain places meet all of the safety requirements to have it. Why was CRI the best place for the partner to solve the partner's barrier to grow through R&D? Fensher comes with a biosafety level two lab, which was necessary as wild strains of bacteria are being tested. There is also innovative equipment and instrumentation that Fensher possesses and makes possible to perform out of the ordinary tests. Fensher also comes with professionals that are expert on these topics. What has been accomplished with the project? An antimicrobial solution that is ecologically friendly has been made. Its shelf life has been determined. Formulations and calculations involving the product have been, have been established. While strains have been obtained. And the antimicrobial efficacy of the product will be tested soon. Testing protocols have been designed and reviewed. And new additives will be tested and approved based on upcoming results. As a student, what do you gain? I gained lots of experience and knowledge with utilization of the new equipment. It was also exciting taking part of choices that were very important and decisive for the project, although it was a big responsibility. It also gave me the opportunity to experience what a career-related job would be like, and now I have a more detailed insight into what I want to do in the future. Thank you so much for listening, and I hope you enjoyed the rest of the event. This next project is an incredible example of how the power at Fanshawe comes into play to support research in developing business growth. Professor Josie Pontarelli is a principal investigator in food research for CRI and also a professor in the School of Tourism, Hospitality and Culinary Arts. That's the power of Fanshawe working together. And Professor Pontarelli has supported a project called My Active Snacks. Hi there, I'm Josie Pontarelli, and I am a professor in the School of Tourism, 
hospitality, and culinary arts. Um, I've been a Red Seal chef for over 25 years, and I hold an MBA in food and agribusiness from the University of Guelph. So today I would like to tell you about a research project that I completed for My Active Snacks. Um, I became the principal investigator for this project for a few reasons. I'm a big believer in supporting small business. I always have been. That's something that's really important to me. I've been a business owner and I've understood the challenges um, that, it, that it is to be a business owner, especially for small and medium sized enterprise. So my feeling is that if I have some skills or expertise that can help a company succeed, why wouldn't I want to share that? Um, it's just, it's beneficial uh, for the company and for challenging myself. I love a challenge and the project with my active snacks sounded really interesting. Basically what we were tasked with was coming up with a formulation, a prototype for a keto friendly um, food snack to bring to market, to sell here in Canada um, and hopefully um, outside of Canada as well. So as I mentioned, the partner um, I supported was called My Active Snacks, and they are a small food startup in Toronto. They've got three really passionate owners who uh, feel really strongly about health and wellness, and they really want to bring that passion to um, all of the things that they do with their company. So the biggest challenge for My Active Snacks, um, they're a small company and they don't have an in-house research and development department. So to have this type of work done in the private sector, the scale of testing is really large. So it can be daunting and uh, quite cost prohibitive for a small company like My Active Snacks. So CRI, um, we were really the best choice for the My Active Snacks project because we have the skills and expertise right here in-house needed to address this particular business problem. Now, working with Ian Butcher, who was the research facilitator on the project, it gave me, as well as the industry partner, uh, the support that we needed to keep the project moving forward. The work that Ian does with facilitating all of the things that need to happen to make a project successful, it's beyond compare, in my opinion. Um, he's just amazing to work with and it really helps us to deliver a professional quality product uh, to whatever client we're working with. So this is really important because it allowed us to create this relationship that was really sort of a team um, with Ian, myself, and the business owners from the very beginning of the project at the outset. And so the company always had regular access to the same project contacts, both Ian and myself. So it feels really much more personal than working with a big private R&D firm. And this allowed us to work on a really small scale um, to create this prototype that is exactly suited to the partner's need. So it really comes down to, I think, um, being nimble enough to really customize and adjust the goalposts as necessary along the way, all through the project. Uh, not only to keep the project on track, but to efficiently address challenges and roadblocks that come up because they do. The project was uh, about three months long and we certainly had a few hurdles that we needed to get over. Um, but I think that's what makes it so interesting because it's a real time business problem uh, that you know you need to work quickly and efficiently while still being mindful of you know, keeping that specific problem that you're trying to address in mind at all times so that at the end of the project, uh, you get to a place where you're really delivering um, a solution for whatever business problem you're addressing. So at the end of the three months, uh, I'm happy to say that My Active Snacks now has a successful prototype and it's moving forward to second phase testing shortly which will really expedite um, the time needed to get this project to manufacture and hopefully get the product to market uh, very quickly. 
So that is all I have to tell you about my active snacks. And I look forward to answering any questions you might have um, about the challenges that we encountered with this project, um, about the experience in general, and I look forward to chatting more. Thank you. We're now going to hear about the experiences of two principal investigators at the same time. These are both research associates at CRI up in our Carib Labs. So Hale Kazi, PhD, and Kamal Al Rafia, PhD, are both supporting a project called ANA. Let's hear from them. My name is Sohail Ghazi. I am PhD in Applied Microbiology from the University of Saskatchewan. I'm interdisciplinary scientist with a background in microbiology, biochemistry, and molecular biology. I have more than 10 years of experience in collaborative projects between government, academia, and industry that have a significant impact on our daily lives. Our project is an effort to reduce the use of chemicals in agroecosystem to enhance crop productivity that has negative impact on the environment. We are harnessing the natural power of microbes to enhance crop performance in eco-friendly manner. Our project partner, ANL Biological, is a leader in the area of food and agriculture biotechnology. The project started because global warming and climate change are causing increased diseases and pest invasions into new areas that prompts the need for more effective, efficient, and eco-friendly strategies. In addition, there's a resistance against the use of chemical fertilizers and pesticides from general public due to the awareness about the negative effects associated with their use. The current project is centered on the knowledge-based management system then, that can optimize crop production in terms of ecological and economic perspectives. The role of CRI is critical. It works within a close collaboration with industry partners to identify problems and provide innovative solutions. It also provides student real world experience to support trained human resources in Canadian industry. It houses some of the unique equipment, for example, seed treater that has the capacity to be used for industrial applications. So far, we have developed methods to test the coating efficiency of the seed treater and have developed techniques for coating seeds with microbes using natural formulations, which is a, a crucial for the real success of the growing seed coating bioinoculant industry in Canada. Hi, uh, my name is Kamal Rafi, and uh, I have a PhD in chemical engineering uh, from Waterloo University. Plus, I am licensed engineer with more than 20 years of experience in industry, including uh, chemicals, pharmaceuticals, and aerosol industries. My role in uh, CRI Financial College is leading research projects in terms of improving the manufacturing processes and as an investigator in biotechnology uh, disciplines. I'm very interested and uh, passionate in, in improving the crop's performance through uh, seeds uh, coding processes uh, and assisting in uh, uh, improving the uh, seedlings establishment while achieving high yields uh, for food quality and uh, reduced chemical uh, fertilization. Seed coating is an effective strategy to introduce microbial uh, anticoagulants into uh, the cultivation practice. This is the best method, in my opinion, to deliver agents in the right amount, at the right place, and at the right uh, time. Our uh, partner uh, uh, in, uh, from the industry, uh, they are INL Biological, practical bio-based solutions to the agricultural industry. They are a leader in crop production and performance. Uh, in this project, uh, 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 we are trying to meet the uh, needs for uh, development of a precision agriculture. Seed coating has been widely used in agriculture as an effective means to uh, uh, elevate biotic and abiotic stresses, uh, thus enhancing the crop growth uh, yield and health, plant growth promoting microorganisms, the, the process or the method called PGPM, plant growth promoting uh, uh, microorganisms, as recognized as essential contributors to improving the agriculture uh, productivity. Recently, uh, biological seed coating 
with uh, the method of PGPM is proposed as an alternative to conventional seed treatment, such as uh, fertilizer and protection uh, products. products. Uh, due to its ecological uh, safety and socio-economic aspects. Uh, we are in uh, CRI Financial College works with industry and community partners and uh, with financial researchers to develop innovative research projects and the programs. We are training the financial college students uh, on industrial and practical experience to support the human resources in Canadian industry. We are utilizing some of the advanced equipment uh, and devices in biotechnology industry, such as bioreactors, HPLC, GC, and of course, seed coater that can be used in the related industry. Uh, uh, our own accomplishments in this uh, project, we developed a method for treating the seeds using the uh, NoroGuard R300 machine, uh, measure the method efficiency, and of course, training the student on using uh, this machine. We tested many coatings on different variety of seeds, such as uh, soybeans and wheat seeds, and uh, other seeds, of course. We developed a technique in preparing microbes by using a natural uh, 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 formula. We're now at the end of our project examples from CRI. And this is one that's coming. This is the future of innovation driven by the power of Fanshawe. And it's all about sustainable building research. Buildings are getting older, new ones have to be built, and our world needs help being healthier. We're gonna be doing this big time at Fanshawe Let's hear from Professor Tom Davis from the Donald J. Smith School of Business Technology about what's to come empowered by CRI in sustainable building research. Hello everyone, my name is Tom Davis. I'm a professional engineer here at the Donald J. Smith School of Building Technology at Fanshawe College in London, Ontario. I wanted to talk with you today about some of the sustainability research that I'm involved with as a principal investigator. Just to give you a little background on myself, I'm a civil engineer with over 40 years of experience in heavy construction globally. I'm also a registered professional engineer in Canada and the US, and I work as a mentor with former US Vice President Al Gore on the Climate Reality Project. My role here at uh, Fanshawe College is multifaceted. Uh, I guess first and foremost, I'm a professor and I teach in uh, the architecture, civil engineering, and construction engineering programs. I'm also the college coordinator for sustainable initiatives. So I get involved in all sustainability projects that the uh, college enters into or considers. I am also a member of the Board of Governors as an academic representative, the only one for the campus. And uh, I also sit as an academic member on the national uh, Canada's National Net Zero Council. And last and certainly not least, the topic that we're here to discuss today, I'm a principal investigator for applied research here at Fanshawe College. Just to give you a little bit of insight as, as to what I'm doing and why I'm doing it, uh, you, you might have gathered from my involvement in the School of Building Technology that I'm working with construction. And instead of working with new construction, which is about 3% of our construction market every year, I'm working on the retrofit or deep energy retrofit market. So we're taking existing buildings on the planet, which are highly wasteful. In fact, uh, buildings are, respons are responsible for 50% of all of our greenhouse gas emissions in Canada. So with that, uh, we're retrofitting all existing buildings. Uh, our first phase of uh, our Kestrel course research here at um, Fanshawe College is retrofitting buildings, residential, multi-unit residential buildings to uh, net zero status. That means that these buildings will generate as much energy as they consume over the course of a year. And that's transforming from very highly wasteful 
uh, practices. For example, these buildings currently leak five times their volume every hour. And that is unfortunately representative of many of our homes in Canada. So far, one home has been retrofit. Uh, we're going to be retrofitting 11 units at, in our first phase. And that's a start on the 14.5 million homes that Canada will need to have retrofit before 2050. Ideally, we'd like to be halfway there in the next nine years by 2030. As far as long-term vision for sustainable buildings, it's, you know, this is the only avenue that I can see where we can attack 50% of this global problem called climate change and uh, get it under control. So we're working with the federal government here in Canada as a national initiative. And I'll little, throw a little quote in here from Al Einstein. And he once said, in the middle of difficulty lies opportunity. So using that logic, I'll suggest to you that we're in perhaps the most challenging time humanity has or will ever face because of the fact that our, our planet is literally on fire. Where are we going with this? We have the residential sector, we have commercial buildings, including factories that all need these renovations, all the, all the factories that build all the products that we, meet, uh, that we need and use in our day-to-day -day life. Uh, it also internets with what we are uh, ties together with what we call the Internet of Things. So all of these high tech upgrades have the ability to generate data. And as a result, we can collect that data and compare it back to our numerical models that we use to forecast the outcome of events before we engage in them. Research is beautiful because we get to actually engage in those events and then measure the effects afterwards and compare them to our predictions uh, made by software at the beginning of time. So there's a, a, a lot of room for expansion here. Right now I have uh, roughly 20 industrial partners engaged and 17 academic programs engaged in this research project and it goes from constructors and builders and architects to uh, electro embedded electronics systems for the Internet of Things aspects of this, to renewable energy generation and storage uh, for not only these units, but for the planet going forward. The Center for Re Research and Innovation here at the college is, is here to support these sorts of scholarly and applied research activities. So uh, I'll just explain in colleges, we engage in applied research and that is really focused on innovation. And just to give you a, a quick definition of innovation, innovation is change that adds value. Uh, in university system, they do a lot of theoretical research. Um, theoretical research could take decades or longer. Applied research, we look for real uh, results in the marketplace, in my case, nationally within 18 months. So we have a much more compressed timeline and a uh, much more direct influence on industry here in Canada as a result. So CRI is able to uh, take the grant monies that I've attracted for my research from the federal government and others, and uh, they, they help administer the, the flow of that cash. Um, what do I want to accomplish with my research? Well, saving the planet, okay? Um, I have children. Uh, it's not fair that we're handing our, our children a planet that won't be livable as we know it within 100 years. So I've taken the approach that saving the planet is a team sport. So I engage industry widely. I in, in, uh, engage our academic partners widely and with, since we're a college system we also plug in with not only our, our national community but also our local community partners are engaged in this truly transformative research that will give us all fresh air to breathe for the remainder of our time on this planet so I think it's a worthwhile activity I want to thank you for your time today and, and, and looking a, a little bit closer, kicking the tires here at Fanshawe College. We look forward to engaging you in the future.
repeat something that Professor Cam Davis said. Mentoring former President Al Gore on climate change research. Sanchez doing that. This is all the agri-food research, the industry-based development to grow our economy, all of the student work, all of the power of Fanshawe. I'm not saying this, Professor Tom Davis said this, but it's true. We're working really, really hard through sustainability in every sense to make the world a better place. That's what Fanshawe is doing, and Sierra is here to help. Thank you so much for joining us on what I hope was a very inspiring day. This whole thing has been recorded and you'll be able to play it back at any time as soon as we post it throughout the Fancho College website and social media channels. Thank you so much for joining us today. We hope you've also enjoyed our networking rooms, which will continue right through till 11.30 a.m. If you have any questions, you can contact us at any time at fanshawec.ca slash research. It's been my pleasure to host you today. Thank you so much for joining. And a special thanks to Mind2, our technology sponsor today. What an incredible piece of technology developed right here in London. We beta piloted it today. This is gonna to be the future of live events. I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you for joining.